Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, when he gives them the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, the first petition he gives them is, Hallowed be thy name. Dr. Luther in his small catechism explains what this means like this. He says, God's name is indeed holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may become holy among us also. Luther then, in good catechetical fashion, asks, how is this done? Meaning, how do we keep God's name holy in our life? And he answers like this. When the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as children of God also lead holy lives in accordance with it. To this end, help us, dear Father in heaven. But he that teaches and lives otherwise than God's word teaches profanes the name of God among us. From this, preserve us, Heavenly Father. Hallowing God's name, keeping it holy, having it be holy among us, consists in these two parts. First, that we hear God's word in its truth and purity, that we have it in its truth and purity, and then that we live holy lives according to it, according to the word taught in truth and purity. This, hallowing God's name in these two ways, that is what Christ our Lord is talking about in today's appointed gospel lesson. He gives us the very dire warning and command, beware of false prophets. And I think it's self-evident why this is the case. False prophets teach a false doctrine, which is the opposite of the doctrine that Christ our Lord teaches. It was Christ Jesus who said of himself, I am the way and the truth and the life, and therefore he has the words of everlasting life, as St. Peter confesses in John chapter 6. This means that the false prophets are teaching a false doctrine that doesn't bring life, that doesn't bring one closer to Christ and his gospel, but instead turns one away from Christ by pointing you to something else entirely. And this, all you have to do to see this is open your eyes and look around. We live in a world in which truth has become entirely relativized. Truth, as someone recently told me, is whatever you want it to be. Truth can be multiple things, even contradictory things, all believed by the same person in the same mind at the same time. And since everyone can have their own truth that is peculiar to them, since it's called truth, others can't deny that. This post-truth atmosphere that we live in now, it's not only saturated the world in which we live, and the workplace, and our families, and on everyone's way of thinking, it seems, but it's also polluted much of the visible church, much of visible Christianity, so that when people approach church teachings and church doctrine, that is, if they're approaching church teaching and doctrine at all, they teach it, or they, they treat it more like it's a cafeteria, like they're at Luby's or the Golden Corral. I'll have this, and I'll have this, but I don't want any of that over there. They can pick and choose that which is to their taste, and they can push aside and reject that which is less palatable to their personal taste. In this atmosphere that we live in today, both in the world and in the church at large, Jesus' words to beware false prophets seem almost absurd, because if there's no truth, and if truth is personalized and individualized, then Jesus' words really make no sense at all. In that line of thinking, the very idea that a prophet or a preacher or a song on the radio or something on the internet that could be false, no, it just doesn't compute at all. But Christ our Lord doesn't cater to this fishbowl of a worldview that we live in. There is truth, he says, and there is error. There is right doctrine, and there's wrong doctrine. And the difference is a matter of life and death. For this is why he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. If false doctrine didn't kill, if it wasn't dangerous for your soul and your everlasting salvation, then Christ would have no business comparing false prophets to a wolf. Because what does a wolf do with a sheep if it gets a hold of it? It has dinner. It devours it, and that is what false doctrine and false prophets will do. What makes these ravenous wolves so difficult to spot, though, is that they're not dressed like wolves at all. In fact, they're dressed like sheep. They come to you, Christ says, in a sheep's clothing. And the sheepskin of a prophet, the camouflage which he wears, by which he conceals himself, 
it may very well be an outwardly pious and holy-looking life, but the real sheepskin that the false prophets wear that makes them undetectable is that they use the scriptures to their advantage. They don't blatantly teach falsehoods. They don't blatantly say, I'm not teaching the Bible, because frankly, then who would listen to them? That would be easily detectable. Now, the false, or the, the, the sheepskin of the false prophet is the scripture itself, used incorrectly. Holding the Bible in one hand, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord in his word hath said no such thing. This is really no different than what Satan did in the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. At the second temptation, Satan tempts Jesus using the very word of God. He begins by saying, it is written. And he misquotes the 91st Psalm. He takes a promise of protection in Psalm 91, and he turns it instead into a way of tempting God, which is sin. In this, we see this is what the false prophets do. They use the scriptures, but they do it wrongly. They do so to point people away from God's word and its truth and purity, and they instead point people either to themselves and their own doctrine in its entirety, or an amalgam of the truth with error, in which they have mixed a little bit of leaven in with the lump of scripture. And we know what St. Paul says about this in Galatians chapter 5. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, says the apostle. And so a tiny bit of false teaching may not be detectable at first. It may not be noticeable, but it will, over the course of time, grow and grow until it has filled the mind and the heart with error and lead the sheep astray from God's word in its truth and purity. And so our Lord Jesus Christ gives us this warning, beware of false prophets for good reason. But how do we tell the false prophets from the true? How do we tell the sheepskin from the real thing? How do you spot the false prophet hiding under the sheepskin camouflage? Christ tells you. You will know them by their fruits. And the fruit of the prophet is twofold. First, that the prophet actually lives his life in accordance with the word that he's teaching. Because if he's living contrary to what he's teaching, then he's already outed himself as false. But the second fruit of a prophet is far more important. That is, the fruit of a preacher is his preaching. And just as you don't gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, but rather you look at the fruit and you can tell what sort of tree it is, so it is with preaching. How do you tell whether a preacher's fruit is good, a good fruit by which God wishes to nourish the soul? You test it. St. John tells us in his first epistle, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And how do you test the spirits? By holding up their teaching to the word of God, to the pure fountain of Israel. Is the preaching and is the teaching what the scripture says? Does it say the same thing as scripture in Christ? And if so, then that fruit is good fruit and you can use it for nourishment. But if not, then mark Beware and avoid. This is more than just for preachers, though. This is for anything or anyone who claims to speak in the name of God or to teach the things of God, not just in churches, but in any venue. And so, it is for the preacher in the pulpit, of course, but it's also for the music that we hear on the radio. It's also for the things that we hear on different social media, on the internet. All of these things in which people speak and teach about what God says and about the Christian doctrine, or about doctrine at all, must be measured, not by experience, not by relativized truth, or personal preference, but by the Word of God. You'll know that it's good fruit if it says what the Scripture says, and points to Christ for your salvation. And even though the false teachers use the Scriptures as well, making it difficult to spot at times, the very Scriptures which they employ for their falsehoods will refute them, hallowing God's name, keeping it holy among us by fighting for God's word purely taught. That is one of the most important things in this life. It is of utmost importance, since Christ's word is the word of eternal life. The other way 
that Luther says that we hallow God's name, or that God's name is hallowed among us, is when we as the children of God also lead holy lives in accordance with the word of God purely taught in our midst. And it's this second way of hallowing God's name that Jesus speaks of in the second half of the gospel lesson today. He's still speaking about false prophets, but his words here about good fruit and bad fruit apply not just to preachers and prophets, but apply to all Christians. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And thus he teaches us that faith, that Christianity, is more than simply mere words that come out of our mouth. Not everyone who does great miracles and does great works in Jesus' name is saved, he says, for there are many hypocrites who fool those around them with their words and their works, and some are even so hypocritical that they fool themselves into thinking that they have entered the kingdom of heaven. Who will enter the kingdom of heaven, though? Christ says, He who does the will of my Father in heaven. And what is his will? Again, the Holy Scriptures teach us. For Jesus says in John 6, verse 40, This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And so God's will for you is that you believe the gospel, that you believe in his Son, that you receive the blessings that he earns upon the cross for you by faith each day, that you work to put away sin, that you repent of sin, and that you live each day trusting in the mercies of Christ. That is his will for you. And in that faith, then, God's will is also, then, that you strive to put away those sins, that you strive to be done with them, and instead, you strive towards holiness. St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, your good works towards yourself and towards your neighbor. Many, in fact, way too many these days, imagine that they can simply confess with the mouth that uh, they can confess Christ with the mouth while there's no faith in the heart. Others imagine that they can confess Christ for the forgiveness of sins and yet willfully remain in their sins. To all these, Jesus gives this dire word, I never knew you. Dearly beloved of God, we live in a world where the idea of truth is under attack, where error is given equal footing and equal billing with falsehood, and let's be honest, a lot of times not even equal billing, but preferential treatment. We live in a world where wolves dress as sheep and proclaim falsehood and error in the name of the Lord. So beware. Look at the fruits of the prophets, of their teaching, and compare it with the Word. Study the Word, not only here together, but in your homes, so that you may know the word of God, so that he may feed you with his word, so that you will be able to identify what is true, what is good, what is God-pleasing to nourish us, and what is not. Cling to that word of God that he gives you. Because the wolf, no matter where he be, in a pulpit, or on the radio, or on the internet, the wolf seeks to devour your chief treasure, which is the very word of God. That word that teaches you of God's infinite mercy towards you in Christ Jesus your Lord. The word that freely forgives all of your sins for the, sake of, for the sake of Christ when we repent and believe in him, trusting in him each day. So hallow God's name by abiding in the word purely taught and living holy lives according to it. This is the good and gracious will of God for you, dearly beloved. For you, by faith, are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.